So, Dr. Douglas Beal will be going over the interspinous fusion procedure. Doug, how are you doing over there from the lab? You're doing great. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you very well. Thank you. I'm going to raise this finger. Mm -hmm. So, we're, this is a demonstration on an interspinous fusion spacer. This is a particular spacer is called the Minuteman. It's made by a company uh, called Spinal Simplicity. And so, we're going to start off on a lateral view, and I think that's perfect. Anthony's got this thing lined up, and we're going to start off really targeting the interspinous space. And so, we're going to target this space that we can see here, picture. Okay, picture here, and so shoot again. Just right here, I'm going to go down just a smidge from there, and so this is going to be our starting point. We're going to go through the interspinous space right there, just posterior to the uh, inferior articular process. I'm going to make an incision there. It's about um, a two centimeter incision, roughly, and I make this the same as as some of the other lateral approaches. Doug. So we're gonna, we're gonna guide this thing all the way down in. And Doug. you see that I, we have a little hey, buddy. bit of declination. Doug. So I, wanna, I wanna get it up over the top of the hypertrophic facet joint that's typically what we see whenever we see. Doug, can you hear us over here? Pardon? Can, can you, you hear us? Yes, I can, can hear you. Can you raise the table? Uh, there's a little bit too much uh, air, so we don't have good contrast of the bone. Got it. Go ahead and shoot it again. Thank you. So we're gonna come back around. A lot of times we just want to see the spinous processes. Picture that. I'm gonna go a little bit farther. Picture. Inferior and just posterior to the inferior articular process. Picture that. All right. I'm gonna go down. Picture. And right about there. So let's see where we are on the AP view. That's the interspinous space. And we're going to see if we need to go up over the top of it or if we're at the interspinous interval right there. We could just go through. Can all the fellows uh, see the interspinous space? Well, any questions? So, so as I mentioned earlier, we need to go up and over the top. And we're going to go up over the top, and we can see that we are at the interspinous space right there, picture. And we're going to pierce through the interspinous space like this. Shoot. All right. And then over the top of this, we're going to put on the extender. It's going to fit adjacent, it'll fit on the end of this Steinman pen that's a tapered Steinman pen. And we put the extender on because the next step we have the graduated tap which is this, and it has holes in it for all the way corresponding to the 8, 10, 12, 14, and 16. And as you can see, this is fairly aggressive. This is a sharp tool. This is a disposable kit uh, that is new and pretty fantastic for a disposable kit. Doug, as you put that yep. introducer across, uh, you cross the interspinous space. Uh, did you bump up against the hypertrophied facet on the far side and then climb over the top? So prior to this, we're going to dilate up. So the only incisions that we make are on the skin, and the rest of it's all the way through a dilation process through the two centimeter incision. So we're going to go all the way up to the spinous processes picture. And commonly, shoot that, you will be able to get to the spinous processes, but the rest of the dilation, sometimes we'll hit short of it because of the hypertrophic facet. And this particular cadaver is kind of age appropriate picture. Dilator two, dilator three. Picture that. Good. So let's, let's take a, a quick lateral shot as I put the final dilator in there. So this has an extended Steinman pin, and usually it has enough obliquity so you can keep it out of the II. In the permanent system, they have a flexible Steinman pin. They have a Simon pin that has a lot of flex to it. Great. So we're just posterior to that, and we will go back around AP. You want to just be posterior to the inferior articular process in the back. And I'm going to put the purple dilator. And anything that's, th these are colored, a color matched. Anything 
that has purple can be placed through the purple dilator, and anything that's green can be placed through the green. So we're gonna take the inner dilators out. And we're gonna put the graduated tap over the top of this thing. You wanna remember to hold on to that uh, uh, initial dilator as you're pulling all those dilators sure. out. Otherwise you Good. lose your track. And you gotta start over. Exactly. And you do this, this is a, a threaded tool. And so this threads and it will creep across the interspinous space. It will also decorticate the cortices on the spinous process, shoot. And I'm gonna remove the wire at this point. So you, as soon as the tip gets to the contralateral lamina, you can remove that wire. Don't remove it before when the tip is in the interspinous space. Now Doug, that, is this the point in the procedure where you uh, regret not having become an orthopedic surgeon? Exactly. <laughs> or does that come later when you're putting in the device? Well, anything with power tools that involves that or, you know, with a lot of elbow grease. You, you can see I'm putting quite a bit of pressure on this. And this is, goes with the graduated tap. Let's shoot it there, Anthony. And it goes with, uh, with anything, any of the, the uh, larger screws. Well, you know, I want to. So you can see the holes right there. Those holes, the first hole on the tape represents an 8. The second hole represents a 10. And the third hole, which is kind of my goal for this to show you a real procedure is a 12 millimeter interspinous spacer picture. And we reach the 12 and just like the rule with the vertiflex, anything you should really upsize just a little bit more to be able to get the 12 millimeter implant in. So let's picture that. And so this has enough force, it has enough power to be able to do that. And at this point, I'm gonna re-advance my dilator picture. Does the upside lower the risk of spinous process fracture, upsizing the reamer? Yeah, it's okay. You kind of do it by combination of, of size, patient size, how difficult this is to, to put in. And this cadavers are kind of off because they're, they're, they're frozen. They don't have the same ligamentotaxis laxity. And then the, the, the configuration of the anatomy, is there facet joint gapping? Do you have a little bit of spondylolisthesis? Is there any type of segmental instability? That indicates you may need to upsize a little bit. Is it just a stable spinal stenosis that has no, none of the above? Then you'll kind of downsize a little bit. But it is by feel, too, on the ligament of taxis on this. Okay. So this goes in. And next step, I'm going to remove the graduated tap, and Seth is going to hand me the lightsaber that is called the inserter, really, with the 12 millimeter implant on the end of it. Out goes the graduated tap. So your left hand is maintaining the alignment of the insertion tunnel. Exactly, picture. And this is threaded too, and often this will collapse a little bit, and you'll have to, you'll have to reinsert by clockwise threaded implant picture. And I'm gonna reinsert all the way to the hub. Picture, good. So at this point, I'm gonna look for the wings that come off of the implant. There's a wing reference line. The wing reference line is right here. So this line, this needs to line up. That means the wings are going to come up off of this point. So we put it, the wing reference lines, superior and inferior. And then we deploy, can we take a shot right there, Anthony? Good, and we'll deploy it by doing this, hitting on the, the distal end of it, we'll deploy the wings. Picture that. So we see, see the wings have been deployed, and then we're gonna pull the two together and this knob typically takes quite a few turns to pull the ends together, picture. And you wanna make sure and keep the wings 
superior inferior. And before I do the final tightening, we're going to look lateral, but not quite yet. Picture? We want to see this come together, and you can see it's coming together very nicely. And this is a round implant, but with the wing reference line, it's flat on the top and bottom picture. Okay? So it's, it's about three finger tight now, and the same principle is, is uh, dilating the vertiflex spacer, uh, same principle as, as most things we do is three, three finger tightness, not the over tight. So with that, let's take a look lateral, and they have a plastic holder that we can hold the inserter with to keep your hands out of the radiation, and we'll try to keep the eye eye away from things, yeah. There we go. And so I kind of like that. I'm not going to really make any, any adjustments before I complete the three finger tight. I think that's, that's pretty good. And we'll go with that. And we'll, let, let's save that shot. Come back around, take an AP. Take an AP shot and with this, I'm going to release the implant. I'm going to assume it was just like last time we took a look at it three seconds ago. And I'm going to release the implant. This whole thing comes out. The dilator comes out. And let's take a final shot there. Fantastic. So this is, uh, this is really good. Let's, let's take a shot ladder if you don't mind. And we'll just take two finals on that. So that's very nice L3-4. Uh, placement of this, and that's that's about all it takes. This is not a long procedure. This is an interspinous fusion spacer. It has a graft window in the center of it. Ideally, it's placed just posterior to the inferior articular process, and you can see the spinous processes which the wings grab hold of. This, uh, I mentioned the comment about subsidence earlier. All interspinous implants will have some degree of subsidence, all of them. This has a window in the top and the bottom you fill that window with graft and the spinous processes will subside onto the implant. And so this facilitates fusion. There's a, a paper uh, we wrote um, a couple of years ago, published last year. Um, Matt Skoblar is the primary author, reported a 93% fusion rate with these. These are also hydroxyapatite coated. That speeds up the process of a bone incorporation and cation exchange. Uh, and this is, these fuse very effectively. The only one, there was one in that paper that did not fuse and it was, had a halo around it. So something was wrong, maybe a P. acne's infection or, or something like it. But, uh, but these, these have a, a, a good uh, uh, treatment for stenosis. When you compare these to open decompression, the uh, parameters, operative parameters are better, uh, quicker recovery, uh, less blood loss, uh, patients up and around, less, less morbidities, um, and it has equal outcomes in terms of pain and functional improvement. And so that's an interspinous fusion spacer. This is the Minuteman. Uh, Doug, a, a quick question and, and then from the audience. Uh, what uh, imaging modality are you using uh, to assess uh, uh, the integrity of uh, postoperative fusion? Yeah, CT and CT only. Um, thanks for that, Neil. That's, uh, CT and CT only will assess for fusion. We use what's called the modified Bridwell criteria. The Bridwell criteria is, is interbody fusion and interspinous fusion and uh, fusion in the, the cervical spine. Uh, we use what's called a modified Bridwell criteria to assess for uh, ankylosing or bony fusion um, is defined as uh, is defined in this criteria interspinous as contiguous bone growth or ankylosis from one bone to the next. From the audience, questions? All quiet on the western front. I guess you're done, buddy. Great. Thank you, guys.